Hello, everyone. Hi. Welcome to our uh, live session. I'm very excited to have uh, Mike Reeser and Perry Reed from Industrial Logic here uh, to talk mm -hmm. about how we evaluate progress using uh, Accelerate's 24 science-backed capabilities. So this is uh, very cool stuff. Um, I've really been uh, a fan of what I've been seeing and, and we've been using it at clients and it's been very, very impactful. So if this is helpful to you, that's what we want to share. Um, as usual, feel free to put in some comments, ask some questions. We're here for 30 minutes, and so it's short and sweet, but we're going to get into some of the details about our findings and uh, how what it's been like, uh, you know, leveraging some of these wonderful ideas from this classic book, Accelerate. So again, thanks for coming. Don't be shy. Ask some questions, and uh, let's uh, let's have a great let's have a great session. So first of all, uh, do you want to just introduce yourselves really quickly? Uh, Mike, do you want to go first? Yeah. <clears throat> My name is Mike Reeser. Uh, I've been in software since uh, the 70s and 80s. My dad had a TRS-80, so I got into computers early. Around 2004 or so, I got into Agile, and I loved it. I got introduced to extreme programming and extreme programming practices, fell into test-driven development, and I loved it so much I wanted to show other people how to do it. So uh, I've been a coach since then, been staying very technical, had different tech lead and architect type roles. Um, but I really love helping to improve the lives of software professionals. Um, I've been abused by certain employees or employers um, in certain projects. And I'm like, you know, it doesn't have to be that way. It can actually be far, far different. Um, I was on a team where we were able to deliver software in it felt like a very comfortable, easygoing, relaxed way, but we got a lot done. And um, I really want other people to be able to experience that kind of uh, software development. Yeah. Excellent. Uh, I'm Perry Reed, also with Industrial Logic. Uh, and uh, similar to Mike, I've, I've been working in the industry for many, many decades. <laughs> And uh, I've had a lot of experience in a lot of different domains, uh, starting out in, in the oil and gas industry, uh, but also working in uh, areas of the Department of Defense and aerospace. Uh, got involved in uh, healthcare and uh, was involved in two biotech startups, uh, which really taught me a lot. Uh, but I, similar to Mike, I got exposed to the Agile um, movement in the early 2000s, and it resonated really well with me, many of the things I've learned from that. I, I had experienced personally working on other projects. And so um, after applying it in my own projects, I uh, saw an opportunity to start working with other teams and coaching others. And it became a real passion. Uh, similar to Mike, it's, it's fun when you find easier, better, more effective ways to work and be able to share those with other people. So um, yeah, I'm excited to be here and share what we've learned about Accelerate. It's been very helpful for us. Okay, thank you, Mike and Perry. Um, and if, if you don't know me, I'm Josh Karyowski. I'm the CEO of Industrial Logic. We've been around about 27 years. And our mission in Italy is to help companies produce better software sooner. So that's our mantra. And much of what you're going to hear about today is, is very focused on things like DevOps and lean management. And, you know, XP plays a big role in this as well. Um, it's, a, it's over the many years, we just find whatever really works well is what we're going to use on clients. And yeah. We're not afraid to drop practices if they don't really you know, deliver their weight. We're, we're not into fads. We're into results. And so this Accelerate stuff's exciting. Let's, uh, let's dive in. Um, before I show anything here on the screen, what's your experience with the book real quick? Like, you know, Accelerate is this classic book. Well, let me actually, I'll show a, a photo of it um, so you can all sort of see this. Um, or perhaps Julius can add this to the stage. There we go. Okay, twenty-four capabilities to drive improvement. So, tell us more. What 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 inspired you to dive so deeply into this book to produce uh, this kind of way of evaluating progress? Um, <clears throat> the authors, Forgeron, Humble, and Gene Kim, they did a marvelous job doing a scientific analysis on capabilities, high-performing software teams 
and organizations were using. Um, that might actually be a little bit of a misnomer. They actually sent out a huge number of surveys. They were able to do a cluster analysis on them without actually having any bias about what is good or bad, but just watch how these things clustered out. And they ended up in four different clusters. And later they were able to look at those clusters and name them high performing, um, moderate, low, and then ultra low. Um, I think they finally just grouped the ultra low and the low together. Now, for me, uh, I got a physics background, a math degree, computer science degree. If you can actually show data, and if you can actually show that something has a statistical you know, impact, then you start to get my attention. And so I was running into a lot of different agile transformations. Folks were curious and interested in maturity models. And the maturity models were OK, but um, they didn't always show a real maturity in the fact that an organization that's going to put mature should be able to continuously improve. When I got to Accelerate, I got to see these capabilities as opposed to maturity models working. And so your ability to take on these capabilities were also going to allow you to get better and better delivery. And I didn't have to convince folks that, for instance, you know, I really think the high quality code will help you later. <laughs> because that was one of the things as a natural coach and as an XP -er, I knew, and that is, is there's all these things which we know that if you have automated testing and automated delivery, you have a real ability to start creating flow. If you have high quality, you can actually make that code base do things that you hadn't anticipated before. And so I would always have to try to convince folks of this. And when I read Accelerate, I'm like, there it is. There's the evidence that people always want. So when you can actually say, this isn't just my opinion, this has actually been scientifically shown to be impactful. And um, uh, to me, it was just, it was awesome because I finally had something I could point to rather than just, I really, really believe this. I could actually say, no, this has actually got evidence to it. That's huge. That's really big. And uh, when Mike says he's an XP -er, just just to be clear, he's not, he's not a Windows XP. -er. He's a, <laughs> He's an extreme programmer, and uh, we do a lot of extreme programming around here, including all these lean and DevOpsy things. Okay, so Perry, what, what about your story? Yeah, so as an Agile coach, I was working with teams, and, and all of the teams I was working with, they all want uh, to be better. You know, they want to improve their uh, performance, improve the quality of their code, uh, deliver value uh, sooner to their customers. And I was always looking for ways to introduce uh, new practices and um, techniques that would help them you know, accelerate those things, improve those things. And uh, many of the things I was uh, recommending as a coach were from my own personal experience and my evidence of having seen them work. But when Accelerate came out, I saw basically the, the power of a roadmap that was uh, based on you know, strong science-based research. And just like Mike, I could lean not just on my own advice, you know, my own experience, but I could I could reference, you know, research that you know came from twenty three thousand survey responses to two thousand plus organizations, uh, from two thousand plus organizations. So, it um, really gave a much stronger foundation for the recommendations I was already making, and uh, and made it uh, a much more powerful uh, engagement with the client. Wonderful. Um, so yeah, without further ado, why don't we just look some more at this and uh, so give folks an idea. You know, Mike, do you want to kind of walk us through what, what we're looking at here? <clears throat> sure. Um, the first couple, continuous delivery, and oh, what you have is 24 capabilities that have actually been organized into five different categories. And uh, this was a discovery I made in Appendix A of the Accelerate book. Um, and I thought it just made a great summary of these are the things that are impactful. So, you know, the blue continuous delivery is technical. Architecture is, of course, technical. Product and process and lean management and monitoring has more to do with how you're looking at your software code base. Are you creating a product and how are you, um, what sort of metrics and uh, delivery mechanisms are you using for that? And then lastly is cultural capabilities, which is about your organization, which I think a lot of us who have had any type of a career in software development have seen that really different organizations can behave very different 
and they can get very different results from the folks depending on how they behave. So that was not left out, that was actually included. And the cultural capabilities, I think, are extremely important. And I was very happy when Industrial Logic became a leader, I think, in that psychological safety and the psychological safety workshops, because I believe that starts to drive those sorts of capabilities. Continuous delivery. Um, these are the technical things. Do you have everything under revision control? Can you actually make a change and will it automatically get picked up by a build and everything uh, be re built, repackaged, et cetera? Later you get into the idea of can you deploy it? Um, when you take this to its ultimate um, endpoint, you can have folks who can make very small changes to code and they can actually show up in production just a few hours later and there's just a pipeline that once you start the thing going, it's like a conveyor belt and then just delivers um, changes of the software to production. Some people think that sounds very unsafe, but actually all of these capabilities reinforce each other and it becomes a very safe way to operate. Um, let's see here. One of the other things which I think isn't here, but we also talk about with regulated industries is something called continuous compliance. Regulated industries have the problem that they have to be auditable, traceable. They have to have a lot of change management with, you know, checks on it. It turns out if you're willing to rethink how you do it, you can actually get it almost for free from a highly automated system. And so I try to tell folks, don't re, don't try to automate your manual compliance regulatory system. Actually look at what you've got and with automation and then just basically put the right pieces in place for that. Architecture mostly has to do with um, your different components that you deploy and whether or not the teams are actually enabled and empowered to uh, work on their own servers or whether they end up having to do everything the way an organization might dictate. It's amazing how if you give some folks autonomy, they'll find the best tools for the job. Product and process is, of course, things like, are you working in small batches? Can you create a flow of work? Are you creating flow of value? Um, yeah, let, and just to stop in there for a second, I mean, not, none of these are like, you know, as full featured as you as you want. I mean, there's there's stuff like continuous compliance. Okay, Mike Mike Reeser mentioned that, and we've had to work with companies that are regulated that have audits from government agencies. So continuous compliance really, you know, something we add in to the continuous delivery product and process is, you know, four boxes there. It doesn't mention a lot of lean startupy stuff like validating or invalidating features before you even build them um, and stuff like that. So there's there's more to it, but there's enough here uh, to pro provide a pretty good roadmap. Um, I wanna just really quickly uh, give some focus to a question from uh, Michelle, Michelle uh, Crespin Block. Um, she says, uh, it looks like there's an assessment of where an org is on these dimensions behaviors. What methods you use to gather that score? Um, do you wanna talk a little bit about that? Thank you, Michelle. Sure. Um, I was doing a team assessment and I was trying to get an idea of how they were lining up with progress on these capabilities. I had done a survey where I created a lot of open-ended questions and I delivered the survey in person and I ended up with a huge amount of data I had to go through in order to try to figure out where they were in progress. So. I had asked a lot of subjective questions and then I had the problem that I had to create a subjective um, assessment on it. After that, I um, got the idea to turn it around and ask very closed-ended questions, create a survey for it. And um, it's one that can almost be run solo, so I don't have to actually proctor it. And um, with these closed-ended questions, we can get a much better idea um, <clears throat> from an organization about how they're doing with regard to these different things. If we think that the survey is giving us some bad results, we can always call them, how do I say it, uh, validate them in person, asking some extra questions. But it's been a great tool to try to get an idea of where an organization is at. So these particular things are shown as progress bars. So how close are you to achieving that particular capability? Um, <clears throat> things like version control for all production artifacts is relatively easy to get over, um, whereas that last one, which I think is implementing continuous deployment, it's a bit more involved. Right. So, yeah. And then, uh, like, uh, item number 24 in the bottom right corner is support or embody transformational leadership. 
right? I mean, these are people's opinions. It's it's not it's not that you're you know somehow uh, looking at artifacts in the in the uh, in the organization to validate that. You're really getting opinions from people. So the the surveys, we, you know, Mike's mentioned that this this was a little time consuming at first, right? Because it's a lot of data. We've streamlined it, and because uh, we found it to be so valuable. And in streamlining it, we've produced our own questions for each of these 24 science-backed uh, capabilities. And you know that's always a work in progress. We're constantly tweaking it, but we just used it at another client and it gave us a fairly good picture of what was going on there. Again, you might have questions about specific items and dig deeper into those to figure out, is this a true score or not? But it's, it's very much, uh, Michelle, a, a way that we're getting a picture of the organization to figure out where are they in this maturity in terms of their ability to to be high performance okay um so i know that you all used this at a real client just a couple of years ago um to kind of create a roadmap can you speak a little bit more about that maybe perry do you have any yeah 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 so we we were working with a, a client, Mike and I were, and uh, we had introduced uh, Modern Agile as a set of governing principles. And so we were looking for what of the Accelerate capabilities did we want to focus on? And so we had uh, we had also introduced to them the idea of a user story mapping. And so we actually organized the 24 capabilities and the in these five organization, organizational categories into a user story map kind of format. And uh, we began, as we began working with the teams, we chose certain capabilities to focus on first. And so those were the ones uh, at the top that are labeled in progress. And then, um, you know, so we prioritized the, these things, these improvement opportunities with the client. We identified those things. And because we had introduced Modern Agile, we wanted to sort of cross-reference where these capabilities overlapped with um, what they had already learned about modern agile so we use this as a as a guide and focus on the items you see it there at the top with plans to move next into the the items in the middle and things that were of, uh, of lesser importance for this particular client we put at the at the bottom uh, and it was really helpful for uh, for us as agile coaches working with the teams to narrow our focus to the things that we thought would truly be impactful for this client at this time. And just like uh, the previous slide, you know, the client was already um, doing a many of these things. And so, we, you know, you could give them credit, if you will, for having some uh, accomplishments, some progress on these already. So we gave them credit for the things that we felt were already in progress and the things that we wanted to add to it. But organizationally, this was extremely beneficial for us um, in our uh, collaboration with the client about how to make their organization better and ultimately deliver better deliver better software sooner. And, and for those not familiar with Modern Agile, um, you can learn more at modernagile.org. It's really just four principles that over the many years we've said, this is kind of important for you know teams building products or services. Um, so check out modernagile.org, and there's a very active Slack community there. Um, and th this view here was before we had the progress bars, correct? Mm -hmm. That's correct. Yeah. Yeah. So the progress bars are kind of cool because they show you uh, sort of, you know, how you're doing, as we saw here. And uh, so we've been evolving this as as over time. And, um, you know, this this is a very valuable way to interact with the customer. Did the customer like this? Yeah, very much. Uh, we, you know, we had uh, encouraged them to also, you know, read the Accelerate book again, wanting it not to be, you know, uh, sort of the Mike and Perry show. We wanted you know, it to be very much based on the science that we had learned and, and appreciated from the Accelerate book. So, um, but yeah, the, I think the client uh, very much appreciated a roadmap uh, for improvement and being able to see what we we're working on now and what was uh, coming up further down the road. Okay, so, uh, and again, feel free to ask uh, questions. Uh, we appreciate that one from Michelle. If you have any more questions, please don't be shy. Um, I have a question, which is, uh, it's common to build the wrong thing. 
right? To build something customers don't even want or, or not, not going to use. Does this address that? Uh, it does actually. Um, I'm a little bit better with the yeah. other version of the slide. There we go. Um, actually, under the green product and process number 11, it says oh. gather and implement customer feedback. Hmm. So one of the things that you'll see the Accelerate book and a lot of other folks not already know this too, and that is, is that you want to be able to put something out there and get feedback rapidly to be able to change what you're putting out there. And if you have no mechanism for getting customer feedback, then how are you going to do such a thing? And so this kind of brings it front and center and says, yeah, you know what? You need to be able to gather and implement customer feedback. And it's interesting because some industries have users that aren't customers. They have customers that pay the money but aren't users. And so you have to make sure that you're getting the right kind of feedback from the right folks. Um, but in general, it looks pretty straightforward. Yeah, you gather your customer feedback. And, and I think number 16 in lean management and monitoring might also be related? Um, that one has a lot to do with, can you preemptively know how are your systems doing? You know, are you leading, are you leaning toward a time of um, like high activity and will you crater and that sort of thing? So some of this is to be preemptive. Um, let's see, check system health is also proactive. Yeah. I wonder if 16 also gets into like metrics, the keeping usage metrics. For, for features? Yes. Um, you want to be able to feed back to the business um, data so that they can make database decisions about what's actually happening. Right. Very cool. We're, we're, okay, so were any of these harder than others? There's five major categories here. In terms of your experience in helping companies, you know, improve with this roadmap, um, you know, were any of the, could you say anything about that? What's what's harder, what's easier in general in your experience? One of the one I think is most common across all of them and is also difficult is for folks to work in small batches, number 13. Everyone always wants to batch up huge amounts of stuff and send it all out <laughs> in a big bang. And um, if they could just lead with thinking in terms of, could we do something smaller? Can we get that out sooner? Can we get some feedback on it? Um, they would do very well. Now, I'm a big fan, of course, of the things in blue, which are mostly like technical pipeline types of things. Um, and I know that once they get those in place, it's kind of a one and done. Yeah, you have to maintain it. But once you have it in place, um, you know, it's it's there. You just keep using it. But, <clears throat> but some of these other ones are more of the people issue and how they think about work. Very I'd be interested in how you'd answer that question too. Yeah, the uh, big fan of the items in blue as well, and, and also uh, the product and processes. The things I think that are more difficult are are the organizational change, the cultural capabilities, um, because that relies on uh, people being willing to change. And that you know, as as I know, both you, Josh, and and Mike um, know when whenever we sit down with a a client and are talking to them about, you know, a possible engagement or even just an assessment. One of the things we have to evaluate and help them understand is, are they actually willing to change? And um, changing people uh, is hard. And, and some clients, it's um, it's harder than others. And so, you know, I, I found that uh, to be a, a very interesting thing. They may recognize that they need to change, but uh, if they don't have the will and the determination to do it, um, it it's going to be a struggle. Great. Yeah, and I'll just note, I think that what Mike was saying earlier in terms of the blue side of continuous delivery, if you're going to move towards that, you kind of need to work in small batches, number 13, right, from product and process. You, so it, there's, a Venn, there's like a Venn diagram in some sense here. Uh, these things overlap. Um, so they, they do play well together and you kind of need them together to, to really make this work well. And I mean, this isn't easy, right? You're talking about high performance teams, uh, getting to do all this stuff, right? I mean, most organizations don't do this, right? No, um, at least not the ones that be invited to come help. <laughs> right. right. It's a high bar and 
it's can you say more a little bit about like so the statistical proof has that helped right you said mentioned that in accelerate there's statistical proof of these things have, mm -hmm. have you found that that has helped customers to sort of say all right i buy it right the, this is great let's move towards this since it is backed by science um typically don't have much trouble with management sometimes the developers themselves they kick at some th some things and rather than just having it be my opinion your opinion and we can't really make any progress i can say well you know take a look at the book <laughs> you know um you could be the equivalent of a flat earther or you can actually get with the science um right. and so uh you know it, it changes how you i mean i'm never so brutal but i mean you can actually converse with someone and say well look these things have been shown to be impactful right. and there are some that are more impactful than others and we can decide how we're going to adopt them in what order um generally they're they're independent some of them are definitely sequenced very um, good yeah and I know, I mean, uh, I know that we're we're using some of these in assessments. So this is what you're seeing here is part of an assessment of an actual team. We've anonymized it, of course, but Mike just recently performed this at a client. And like there was very specific feedback about for all 24 capabilities, you know, what needed to be done to make improvements. Do you, we, in, in the few remaining minutes or like how about in a minute, can you say a little bit more about that? Well, each of the progress bars were showing, you know, how they weren't quite there yet. And so if they were to ask me, well, what is it missing? I'll be like, well, it's these. And so I just sort of pre-answered that question ahead of time and said, these are the things that um, you'd have to address for me to get you up at that, you know, that to convince me that you're actually doing that capability successfully. Right. So it's very, very specific. You're able with these capabilities to hone in on what what's missing. What do you need to do specifically you know, to get to, let's say, 100%. Um, and, and that can then be, of course, put onto a now, you know, later or what some kind of a roadmap, like you showed yeah. earlier. Yeah. yeah, as a matter of fact, in each of those sections at the end of it, I put a roadmap for that particular category so that they would know what to take, tackle in what order. Right. More examples here. So, um, yeah, that's basically, uh, you know, kind of a, a, a look at, you know what we've been doing here with accelerate metrics um it's it's definitely a you know uh, it's a work in process in terms of us continuing to roll this out and help companies with this uh but we're we're finding it's it's very very useful mm -hmm. um so i think michelle has another question here mm -hmm. What would you focus on with the client once they've gotten 100 percent oh good question <laughs> Well, yeah. Me or Tara? Yeah. Well, one thing that jumps out to me is that um, the way we worded some of the questions in our survey, we were giving them credit, for example, if they were doing, you know, for uh, continuous integration, if they were doing a commit a day or something like that. Yeah. You know, and uh, clearly, you know, that's a very low bar to, to meet, you know, are you doing something uh, and do the do team members get access to to all of the code within 24 hours? Again, a very low bar to set for a standard. You know, with teams that we've worked with, you know, our expectations is that they are doing dozens, if not, you know, 30, 40, 50 commits a day. You know, and so the higher numbers, I think, are would be indicative of a higher uh, performance level or higher expectation for those teams. Particularly also on the cultural capabilities. I mean, that that's a constant work in progress. Mm -hmm. that's it's very rare for people to get 100% in all of those and stay that way. I mean, the organization changes over time too. So when once people come and go, you've got to you know go back to those things. So. Yeah. Well, we're at we're at time now. So um, you know, I really uh, appreciate uh, both Mike and Perry for joining us today. Thank you to Michelle for her questions. Uh, thanks to Julius for helping us put this show on. And uh, if you have more questions for us, uh, just go to industriallogic.com. There's a contact uh, form you can fill in if you want to learn more. And uh, we hope this was useful. We hope you read the book Accelerate and benefit from it the way we have. Um, again, thank you so much for coming. <laughs> <laughs>